Rob. I'm Chris from DP Review. Oh, nice to meet nice, you. Nice to meet you too. Um, I really want to get a camera early. I know it opens at 10, but can I get an ESR now? I mean, it's like 5.45. I was kind of sleeping. Uh, could you wait four hours? That's four. Four hours. So, no? Welcome back, Deep Your View TV viewers. Chris Nichols here from Deep Your View. Uh, let me make note, of course, that it's incredibly windy out here next to the ocean, so the mic's gonna maybe have a hard time. Also, obviously, we are in Hawaii. It's beautiful. Canon has flown us out here. They've put us up because they want to show us the brand new Canon EOS R. However, I do want to mention after that disclosure, this is a full production Canon EOS R, and therefore, I will be honestly reviewing this over the next couple days, both the good and the bad. You're gonna to want to stick around. We're gonna tell you all about this camera. Now, before we get started, I also want to mention that Jordan is also using a Canon EOS R to shoot this entire video, so this will also be a good test for that. And today, he's gonna to be shooting 4K. It does have a 1.7 crop, so he's rocking EFS glass 1755-28 on an adapter to help mitigate that issue. And he's doing this handheld continuous autofocus, so, well, you be the judge on if it's good or not. Now when you first pick up the Canon EOS R, it takes you by surprise because this doesn't really look like a mirrorless. It certainly doesn't feel like one. It feels almost exactly like a Canon SLR. Not just the Canon S grip, but also the fact this camera weighs 660 grams, marginally lighter than a 6D Mark II, but of all the mirrorless cameras that have just come out to date, this is by far the most SLR looking and feeling of the bunch. And I think that's a positive if you're trying to win over Canon SLR users. You could treat this as an EOS SLR that happens to have an EVF. Couple that with the large lenses, the 24 105 l the 2870 F2 especially, the 51.2, it really feels and is reminiscent of an SLR kit. All right, so as you can see, we picked a very dangerous spot to shoot this next part. So it brings me to how well sealed this camera is. Now, when you first look at the camera, it's got impressive seals on the mounts. And I've talked with the Canon techs and they're saying this is roughly as well sealed as a Canon 6D Mark II. So it's not really up to the 5D Mark IV or professional SLR spec. Keep that in mind. And therefore, I'm gonna keep it far away from all of this stuff. So on the new 24-105 f4 and the 50mm 1.2 that I'm playing with today, I do have this new front control ring. It is clicky only, there's no smooth control on it, but it does give me a lot of functionality and I can customize it. I kinda wanna talk about that next. Uh, I've got this set for aperture. I love just changing my aperture right on the lens and I've never been able to do that on a Canon before. And so I'm setting up a shot and I'm used to Nikons where if I turn this to the right, the aperture goes wider, and if I turn it to the left, it closes it down. But Canons are reversed. But to its credit, the Canon EOS R actually really lets you customize all the dials and controls. I can reverse direction. I can change what they do to a large degree. And so this brings me to one more thing I want to talk about, which is unique on this camera, and that's this new multifunction bar control. Now, there's no press capability to it. It's touch sensitive. It feels you're swiping and you're pressing. And you know, the idea of this is again, a very customizable control. For example, I could have this as my ISO dial, uh, for lack of a better word, and I can swipe to the right to change the dial, swipe to the left to change the dial, and then I can also customize the right and the left press to do something else. For example, press right to go to a high preset ISO, press left to go to a low preset ISO, for example. But I can go beyond that, and I can actually customize these buttons to many other things. So that's a nice touch, except the sensitivity on this bar is still a little bit weird. There's some times where I'm gonna press left or press right, and it's just not engaging. So hopefully they improve that as this camera gets better with new firmware upgrades. On top of that, if you feel that you're gonna press it too often, because it is very easy to touch by accident, you can set a delay function where you have to hold your thumb there first before it lets you do things. I guess that means that you're not gonna have accidental presses, but it also really delays your shooting. 
So of course, as you can see, it's quite bright out here. And I just want to talk about the screens on this camera. First thing you're going to notice, of course, classic Canon fully articulating screen. It's a touch screen. Of course, Canon does that very, very well. And this is very important as we talk about vlogging later on, but this will be awesome for selfies and vloggers to use. The other thing I like is, of course, a very high-end EVF. Now, this is 3.69 million dots, which is very high res, but it does only have a 60 hertz refresh rate in the you know, highest quality performance mode. You compare that to the Sony's on the market, the a7 III, for example, those can go 120 hertz. However, there is a resolution drop when they do push those high frame rates. I'd find this to be very useful. It's got great punch and magnification settings for either stills or video and minimal blackout. So they've certainly done a very competitive job there with the EVF. Last thing I want to mention, of course, we do have a top deck LCD. I don't know what's going on. It's like the industry all of a sudden just demands top screen LCDs. I'm not a huge fan. I find them kind of a, a waste of real estate, but it's there. Everybody else is doing it too. Now the staff at Deep Your Review did some interviews with Canon technicians and engineers. And one of the big things that they talked about was the lack of a mode dial. That was a big, difficult decision. And they finally decided to go without one. You have this mode button and you turn the back dial. It works fine to the point where you could even customize that mode button to do something else and lose your mode dial altogether. As well, other things I find strange. I like AF on, as you guys know, but this is in a weird position. You really got to crank your thumb back to the right and it is somewhat uncomfortable. By the way, do you think C-Log can handle all that contrast back there? I guess you're gonna find out. Now, further on to our discussion about how big a departure the design is on this camera, you now have this flexible mode, FV. So it's very much like Pentax's Hyper Program and stuff like that. Basically, what it lets you do is use the front dial to toggle between TV, AV, and ISO controls, and then the back dial to manipulate those. So you can really set this camera up however you want, fully manual, shutter, aperture priority, without having to really mess around with anything else. So with practice, you might find this mode very useful. I myself am probably going to stick the old fashioned way. All right, so we're just going on a jungle excursion here, looking at beautiful waterfalls in Hawaii. And just to mention some stuff that Jordan's doing right now, he's shooting 1080 at 24 frames per second, and he's using the 24-105 F4L RF lens. He's also using the digital stabilizer right now because, of course, there's no inbuilt stabilization. Okay, so we've got a 30 megapixel full frame sensor in the EOS R. It's likely the same or very similar to the 5D Mark IV, although we do have the new Digic 8 processor behind it. You know, let's say something about this sensor. I mean, I personally do like the look of this sensor. I like the image quality that it puts out, but is it state of the art? Is it as good as the competition? No, I mean, Canon generally based on the sensor and the processor backend architecture that they use is probably losing still a good stop of dynamic range to the competition. However, do keep in mind that compared to a 6D Mark II, this sensor is quite a bit better and not a, that much more of a, an expensive price point. So all in all, I think photographically, this sensor is fine. It's a good midpoint between the 24 megapixel and 42 to 46 megapixel sensors on the market. Now the EOS R also has dual pixel RAW that you can turn on and off. And of course, this is a big part of why the sensor focuses so well. But as far as using dual pixel RAW, we just don't recommend it. It's still not well implemented. We can't find many practical benefits to even turning it on. So we talk about peripherals on the EOS R. I know a lot of people are a little upset about the LPE6N, but it makes sense because they're trying to support existing SLR users moving into this. Now that means a rating of about anywhere from 350 to 370 shots SEPA rating, whether you use the EVF or the back screen. Now, I have to say, from a photographic standpoint, it seems to be lasting a pretty long time. I'm fairly confident, and the fact is, using the LP6, there's going to be a lot of spares. Everybody just seems to have them floating around the house. 
Well, as you can see, my job is pretty hard. Uh, we are out here sailing just off the Maui coast and uh, I got a drink in my hand. It's a beautiful day, I'm doing good. But this is definitely a two-handed camera because as you can see, hitting this on off button with a drink is possible. There we go, but not easy. All right, so while we're bouncing up and down here on these waves, it seems like a you know, appropriate time to talk about in-body image stabilization, or of course the lack of it on the Canon EOS R. This doesn't have it and that's a huge letdown. I mean, there's so many other cameras at very similar price points and spec lists that have inbuilt stabilization. It's a huge letdown, not only for video users who are gonna have to deal with rough rolling shutter and digital stabilization, but as a photographer, I want it for macro. I want it for the huge line of Canon lenses, both RF and EF that don't have IS. And of course, with a flange distance like this, you know there's gonna to be tons of adapters coming out for this mount. And those lenses are a lot of cases not gonna support IS either. It seems like just a really sad thing to leave out. And it means we're gonna to have to wait for some new version to get that feature. I had such a wonderful time on this boat. This is not, there's nothing to do with the reflection of the cruise. But the last thing that I wanna complain about, the touch screen on this. And this is strange because Canon normally has a really good touch screen. I've always liked the interface, but I feel like when I'm moving the autofocusing point around, it's fairly laggy. I also find if you're in playback mode, even though it's a fast card slot, the touch screen sometimes lags a little bit. So all in all, I know it's a small complaint, but I guess I just figured the touch screen would be a little bit quicker and more responsive here, especially with the new Digicate processor. Okay, that's it. That's it for complaining on the cruise. All right, so let's talk about autofocus performance on the Canon EOS R, because this is gonna be a big one. So first off, the EOS R is designed to autofocus basically like all the SLRs have in recent past in live view mode, okay? So by default right now, the camera's set for face detect autofocus. If it doesn't see a face, it'll go to closest object. And of course, the face detect does work very well, but there is an issue. What if you have multiple faces in the shot? What you do have is an override. I can put my thumb on the touch screen, I get this orange circle, and I can move it to a different face or another target. That seems okay, except that it's a little bit slow, especially with this laggy touch screen interface. But rather what I wanted to try out was the Canon EOS R's version of subject tracking autofocus. I find this a lot easier when I wanna just choose a subject, put the point on it and have the camera follow it. So I went into the menu function, initial servo AF point for face tracking, and I changed it off automatic. I could simply place my focusing point on a subject and you can see Jordan and I here being tracked very, very nicely. If it sees a face, it'll follow it. Otherwise it can put onto a different object and it'll track that as well. This would be a lot akin to something like Nikon's 3D tracking system. Now the Canon EOS R has made some improvements in its subject tracking. I found it way better than the EOS DSLR's ITR tracking mode, their intelligent tracking. And I would say that overall the Canon EOS R's focusing was confident, it was aggressive, it did a good job and it was fairly sticky. However, sometimes we'd still find that it would track to another face for no reason or get lost. I mean, there's still a bit of a nervousness involved. So although it is improved, if you compare it to other camera subject tracking on the market right now, Canon still has quite a ways to go. Let's cover the pupil detect system, which is their version of eye autofocus. We originally saw this ourselves on the Canon EOS M50, and it does work very well, but you have to remember it's in one shot mode. So this means that if I'm standing here very still looking at you in a still frame portrait, it's gonna do a great job picking up my pupil. But the minute I start to turn my head or one eye goes for, you know, closer than another, or of course, if I'm walking towards or away, it's just not gonna work. And this is in stark contrast to companies like Sony and now the Fuji X-T3, which have eye autofocusing that will track in continuous beautifully. So we're now getting minus six EV autofocus capability, but that is with 1.2 aperture lenses. But the EOS R always focuses with the widest aperture possible. It doesn't close down the aperture like a lot of other camera companies do. And although never perfect, it did a pretty decent job in low light. Now, when it comes to continuous shooting speed, the frame per second burst rate is a little bit slow compared to the competition. You get three frames per second if you want focus priority accuracy. If you're okay with 
with maybe it being a little bit out, you get five frames per second, but that's the fastest you can get with focus confirmation. Otherwise, it's eight frames per second without continuous focus. At three frames per second, the camera's brilliant as far as EVF blackout time goes. Nice and smooth, you always feel like you're ahead of the action, I really enjoyed that. At five frames per second, it's not bad, it's a little bit like a slideshow, but it's still usable. And again, the only caveat I would say there is that the Sony a7 III has the same issue, but it does it at 10 frames per second, not five. Oh. Hey guys, it's Jordan to talk about video on the ESR. And I've been shooting with this basically all week, so I've had a good chance to really put it through its pace. Oh, hey. Hi, Steve. Hey, how are you? Didn't see you there. Uh, you keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Steven Eckert, who shoots um, Jared Pull and Thronos Photos show. Yep. And I think we can all kind of agree that it is a very insanely well-produced show that you Thank do you. with... Canon cameras yes. primarily. Yes. And how were you finding this using it to really quickly bang stuff out all day? Uh, it's been pretty good so far. I've been shooting mainly the native picture style. I haven't been messing with C-Log too much just because we're trying to just crank out right. as much as we can. Uh, the ergonomics are very friendly mm -hmm. um, if you're coming from a 5D or existing 6D user. Uh, there's a lot of customization, which I'm not Finally. used to. Yeah, it's really nice, actually. Let's talk about the core specs on this camera. We've got 4K recording with it. Which is very nice. Yeah, we've got 1080 up to 60 frames per second. Yeah. Not exactly class leading, but we do have 120 frames as well. Unfortunately, 720p. Yeah. There's no continuous focus, again, just it like seems, the 5D. Yeah. And the 4K as well, it's the same thing that we had an issue with with the 5D. It has that dreaded 1.7 drop that we all despise, and then it's 1.8 yeah. if you go into the digital IS mode which isn't great. Yeah, you guys shot some, quite a bit of 4K, so how'd you cope with that? So what I had to do is I found myself stepping back a lot. I shot with the new 24 to 105 f4 LIS lens. This whole area, obviously we have a lot, a lot of open land here, so it wasn't yeah. too bad stepping back, but if you're in a small space, very tough to shoot in 4K. Yeah, I kind of found a workaround for that because one big advantage this has over the 5D4 is with the mount adapter, you still get support for EFS lenses. Which is awesome. So I could see so many people grabbing this camera, the adapter, the basic one's very inexpensive, throwing that little 10 to 18 Canon STM lens on it. And Cropping down through the vignette killer vlog setup yep. for it, shooting in 4K, but that's really the only way I think the 4K is functional on this. And one other thing I noticed that photographers will really appreciate is the battery life. It's mm -hmm. the same exact battery, and I had no issues with it. I used a grip, I used yep. two batteries, but by the end of the day, after shooting about five or six hours with it, full, full 4K, yep. 1.7 4K, <laughs> uh, I was down maybe 30% on each battery. It yeah. was not bad at all. Yeah, I was finding well over two hours, which is pretty close to what we get on the GH5, which I love for battery life as well. One of the main reasons I think a lot of people still use Canons, because they have been lagging behind in terms of specs, is they have the best video autofocus out there. But pixel, yeah. I had some interesting experiences. How did it work for you? So I mainly stayed on single point the entire time. I really didn't use face detection. We used it a handful of times, but not all day. Yeah. I had no issues using the touch and drag AF, trying to switch my focusing point and just sticking with that all day. Yep. And we also tried a face detection shot shooting Jared at 51.2 and it tracked pretty well, but it was only for about 30 seconds I used the face tracking in this camera. See, I kind of gave myself a challenge with it where I was just gonna use face tracking and subject tracking the whole time. And I found it actually getting confused a lot. Really? And we've done this same test before with the M5, with the ADD, had no problems with any of the footage. This time I really constantly found that it was just, it looked like it was nervously looking for something Hunting. else, which Panasonics have a tendency to do as well. So, uh, you know, I'm okay if it gradually drifts over to something, but this was very, uncanon like in that it would just like jump over somewhere jump back second guess itself nope. um, I was honestly pretty disappointed in it so I would use your technique just single point and then rely on face detect if you have to track a face continuously just be aware it's not a bulletproof solution there are some things that are just huge glaring issues for me. I shot a lot of log, but as soon as you start rolling, you lose your histogram. Which I it. can't stand. Yeah. Another issue I found is there's no zebra lines in this, yeah. which I would always rely on when I'm shooting with my Sony a7 III. That's how this. I tend to expose, especially when your histogram's gone. You exactly. need some sort of exposure yep. aid. So that brings me to probably the biggest issue that most people are gonna have, which is that there is no inbuilt image stabilization on this. It's in the lenses, but half the lenses they announced don't have it. And I know they like to say that you can use the digital IS, but I found the digital IS extremely poor with 
you know, very warpy. Yeah. The enhanced digital IS has it looks an insane like crop. Bad warp stabilizer. Yeah. yeah. That additional crop factor on top of a heavy crop. Uh, yeah, we need some sort of better IS system in this. I mean, gimbals will be fine, but it's more weight. And this is a heavy camera anyways. Vloggers are really going to have a tough time with their shaky footage while they're holding their heavy camera in front of their face. Well, thanks for chatting with us, Stephen. You're welcome. You thanks do for having awesome me. work. It was great to get you on the show. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a weird niche kind of camera. He does that sometimes. Okay, so I'm back in Calgary, but I've had a lot of time to look at the EOS R footage, and I just wanted to comment on the overall quality on it. The 4K especially seems quite soft if you compare it to the oversampled footage from something like an A7 III or a GH5. While we were on the hike and the boat, I was using the enhanced IS while shooting 1080 footage, and the image is unbelievably soft, let alone the fact that you get these weird warping artifacts with it. Having C-Log is really great when you need a little bit more dynamic range in the shot, but you can see in some of our higher contrast scenes, there's a lot of noise in the shadows with this camera, more than some competing cameras with smaller sensors. Now, I do really think that just comes down to having a slightly older sensor in this camera. We saw a very similar thing in the 5D Mark. Four. If you're looking to get a little more out of the C-Log footage, you do have 10-bit 422 out. Now shooting this off to an Atomos Ninja 5, it's odd. I found that the exposure is a little bit different. The 10-bit footage actually is a bit more contrasty than the internal C-Log, but you can see when I applied the same corrections to both of them, the roll-off is much smoother on the 10-bit. If you're looking to get the most out of the C-Log footage with this camera, I do think recording that 10-bit externally makes a lot of sense, but I do have to say I wasn't quite as impressed with the 10-bit signal out of this camera as I was with Nikon's own Z7. Well, it is time to say goodbye to Hawaii, and it's time to say goodbye to the Canon EOS R. And I think, you know, it, it's hard to nail down this camera because there's a lot of good stuff, and there's some bad stuff too. First off, from a photographic standpoint, there's actually a lot to like about this camera. Ergonomically, it's fantastic. It feels solid and well-built, but there are still some things that are really deficient. I mean, it's not gonna win any speed awards. Wildlife photographers aren't gonna like it. I really see this as much more of a 6D Mark II replacement with a mirrorless concept than anything close to a 5D Mark IV. There's weird things missing, like why get rid of intervalometer? It was there before in the cameras. Why isn't it there here? Uh, things like this new multifunction bar, I see where they're going. I see that they're trying to really make a bold move here, but it's not fully implemented. It's strange, it has problems. Often we'd hit it and it wouldn't do anything. And on top of that, we did get some error 60s and things like that. Although Canon has stated, and this was quite unique as well, they're actually very committed to regular and interesting firmware updates for this camera. Now on top of that, let's talk about some of the other things. I know this single card slot. You know, the solution is this, you put a card in, you take a picture, you take the card out, then you put another card in, you take the same picture, you take the card out, and you just keep doing that all day. Super convenient, right? You know, I guess here's the thing. I'm shooting on an event like this. I want to make photos and I want to produce content for you guys. And if I had a card fail on me here, it would be disastrous, okay? And actually, just to give you a proof of concept, Tony and Chelsea Northrop were shooting out here. They had some video files corrupt on their Canon EOS R, and with one slot, What's going to happen? What are they going to do, right? I mean, these are real world difficulties, so I get it. If you're a casual shooter or, you know, your job's not depending on it, you might be fine and you might say, what's the big deal with one card slot? But yeah, if you are a professional shooter or really relying on these photos, it can legitimately be a deal breaker. On the video side, you just can't help but feel that Canon is behind. Even though they've added a lot of customizations and C-Log, you still have the lack of IBIS, no zebras. This camera's weakness isn't really the camera. I think it's the lack of processing capability. I think that's what's holding back a lot of the things that we're expecting to find on these cameras. And with this being Digic 8 and still having those issues, I don't know if we're gonna see this change anytime soon. Keep in mind though that the really exciting thing about this camera as well as its Nikon counterpart is the new mount system. I mean this is really the exciting thing. Don't forget to check out our Instagram feeds, comment below, let us know on Twitter and on DeepYourReview.com what you think about the new sample galleries, the articles coming out about this camera and your thoughts on this admittedly very polarizing new device. Otherwise, we hope to see you soon, probably not in Hawaii, but very shortly.